Greetings, folks. This is Eric. Um, I was given a prophetic word by God. This one is kind of weird. It was actually a dream I had last night, and it was so vivid. And I was told when I woke up not to forget the dream. And I was, I was kind of made to feel through, I guess, the Holy Spirit in me that this information is crucial to um, some kind of uh, unsolved mystery or something like that. So I'm going to read what I wrote this morning based on what I remember from my dream. And it's kind of gruesome, hence the title. Uh, but here we go. And this is, this is being recorded January 29th, 2021. A man and a woman were having babies and making explicit pornographic movies with each other. They appeared to be in their mid to late 30s. And it was in the late 1980s or early 1990s, judging by their clothes and their hairstyles. When the children, either boys or girls, it didn't matter which, uh, when their children were a certain age, the parents would sit them down. And this was the weird part. Okay, so they were killing these kids. Somehow I knew at the end of my vision in the dream that they were killing these kids. But they really put a lot of effort into convincing the kids who must have been at some kind of age to rationalize, you know, eight, nine or ten or something like that. Convincing them that it was for the good of everybody else in the family that those kids should die. And they put a lot of effort into convincing the kids that they were adopted, that those weren't their parents that were killing them, but those were their actual parents. I knew in the dream that those were their actual parents and they were lying to them. I was like, why, you know, they're killing them anyway. Why are they lying to them beforehand? And maybe it's like, um, Making making it a better sacrifice or something because they're not as scared. I I don't know, I don't know. That that part confuses me a lot. But let's continue. For some reason, it was important to these parents to convince their children, begotten of their own loins, that they were adopted. In the dream, I saw the man, who seemed to be handsome enough, he could have been a Hollywood actor, would burn the kids in a bar in a burn barrel a metal burn barrel. Usually one kid would be sacrificed at a time and the parents always put on this elaborate play with dolls or mannequins or as stand-ins for themselves. So I saw like you know those f woven sort of plastic or vinyl woven chairs that you take to the beach or whatever and they're like metal and they fold up. Well it was those. There were two of those set out, and they were in the desert, and I, I saw a Joshua tree and sand, and somehow I, I felt like it was California. I mean, it could have been Las Vegas. It could have been, uh, you know, New Mexico. But no, I felt like it was definitely California that this happened. And what I saw was these two people who look like, well, let's say B-level actors, you know, actors that are famous enough that you've seen them in lots of things, but they've never been the star, the top build actor in the movie. You know, no offense to any B-level B actors or whatever. But, um, yeah, they were sitting in these chairs, just relaxing all, just calm and nonchalant. And I heard the, the man narrating. And he was narrating the whole thing to the kid who was to be sacrificed. And he's like, mommy and daddy aren't really your mommy and daddy, you know. And because, and I don't remember what his logic was, but I remember a whole diatribe of logic. It, it went on for like two minutes at least. And then while he was talking, him and the woman disappeared just popped out of frame all of a sudden and all of a sudden in their place were these like life-size 
uh, Barbie dolls, but they weren't Barbie, right? They were like, um, I mean, they were like 18 inches tall or, well, you have to have life size. They'd have to be six foot tall. It's hard to explain, guys. Maybe what it was was it was a miniature uh, chair and they were making a, you know, mocking up a scene or something. I don't know. I'm just telling you what I saw. And yeah, let's see. I saw the dolls sitting in folding chair, folding campfire chairs. And by the fire as the man and woman narrated their own story, justifying in the tale each time why it was fair, just, and necessary that the child be sacrificed. When I awoke, somehow I knew in my spirit that they were sacrificing children to Moloch. And you'll find Moloch in the Bible. I don't know much about Moloch except that they sacrifice their children to him because it's in the Bible. Uh, I encourage you to do your own research on that too. Then in the dream, I saw the man tending the fire. So this was like, I don't know, an hour, two hours, three hours later, something like that. Might have even been eight hours later. The fire had burned down so much and it had burned so hot that the all the metal of the burn barrel was gone. It was totally disintegrated. All that was left was maybe two or three inches of the bottom of the barrel. I don't know if you've ever had one of those metal barrels and have them rust, you know, from sitting out in the rain all the time. And part of it will just burn right off. It usually takes years and years and years for that to happen. You know, at least a year, at least a year of sitting out in tremendous rain and just moisture like we have down here in the south but in the dream that's what I saw I saw he was flipping the barrel over and as he flipped the barrel over and he was checking it to see uh, if the ashes had fully somehow I just knew he was checking to see if the 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 I guess let's say the biological material the 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 children had fully disintegrated into ash and I could hear children, but like maybe four or five year olds. Um, and I knew they were in spirit. I knew they were dead. It were disincarnate voices of children. And they, it was very interesting because they weren't crying. They weren't like, help us, help us. Or, ah. They were just like, I don't know what they were saying, but here's what it would be kind of like. Yeah, well, that was mommy and daddy, and they did that. It was kind of like that. Like I say, I don't remember what the words were they used, but it was like they were telling their story over top of their murder. Very interesting um, and frightful also. Um, So yeah, he would monitor, the man would monitor and tend the fire, making sure that every bit of each child was fully digested by the fire. He would not leave even when it seemed like they were in danger of being caught, him and the woman, until the whole body was burned up completely as, as if ashes of dust. But he had a compulsion also. He could not help himself. He had to have a souvenir of the sacrifice for his collection. So in, in my dream, I saw she was like, come on, we got to go. It's like the cops were coming or they were going to be found out or something. And she needed to get him into the car so they could get out of there so they wouldn't get caught. Because um, they had almost fully got away with this destruction that they perpetrated. And he, um, he's like... He was heading to the car, but then he's like, no, I, I got to go back and get. And then I heard over top of that, I heard like a cop's voice in a different, in a different scene, talking to another cop or an investigator or something. He was like, yeah, they just can't resist going back for that one last souvenir. They got to have some kind of trophy. And uh, 
It said uh, this was usually just a. The the cop was saying this. Uh, they usually use only take only about a small bit of whatever container he burned them in, plastic or metal or whatever. And then I saw a, a piece of green rubber made toughy container um, that he was taking. And in another instance, maybe a small piece of metal. In the dream, I could see also that he kept his trophies on a necklace or a ring of some sort. There was a, it was like a, a, a ring, like a, like a maintenance worker uh, uses to put keys on. Uh, to, as they go around, um, you know, let's say a maintenance worker for a, a, a corporation or a building or something, they got to have keys to every door that has a physical key. So they have these huge rings on which they keep all the keys. And, and yeah, that's kind of what it looked like to me. It looked like he had all these souvenirs on one of those huge rings. Um... I said a necklace, a ring, or a string of some sort. And then the woman uh, slash mother was attractive also and could have easily been a Hollywood star actress. Like, now don't get me wrong, this wasn't Nancy Travis. I didn't feel like this was actually her, but she's a good example of what this woman looked like. Uh, Nancy Travis in, in, in movies in the 80s uh, with that white lady perm or whatever. But she was equally in on it with the man. She was no victim, but a willing participant in the sacrifices. I saw that they would nonchalantly do their deed in the desert. I felt like it was in a desolate place outside of Los Angeles, like Simi Valley, or perhaps the famous desert where Captain Kirk stood on that red jutting rock in all those shows. I saw that the police suspected these two of murdering children after four of their children that their four of this couple's children had each sequentially, not all at once, mysteriously gone missing over a period of years. And I heard the name semi-child. I thought that was really interesting. It was like it was being told to me a, as a handle, like the name of somebody in a in a in a in a in a in a, in a chat room group or something, uh, maybe who was bragging or arranging with others to do these kinds of deeds. Semi-child, like a semi-truck and a child, or like half of a child, or like part child. It was, it was very interesting. Um, and the Lord wouldn't let me forget it. When I woke up, I had that phrase, like a hashtag going through my mind. It's like, don't, don't forget that. And uh, yeah. I felt like it was a hashtag, a username, or online chat room identifier handle for the man. And the Lord woke me up and said, write this down, make a video about it, and the numbers I gave you yesterday, and post it today. So, the thing is, I may have to pause this video, because I have to find the numbers that he gave me yesterday. They were at the top. Here they are. 76 and 61. He gave me these two numbers. And he said, tell the people. So I'm telling the people. I'm not sure what these numbers mean, what the relevance is. Maybe 76 is when the man was born or when the first murder of, a, of this couple's children occurred. Maybe 61 is when he was born. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe 61 is the birth year of the man, and 76 was the birth year of the woman, which would make her tremendously younger than him. Well, not tremendously, I guess, how much would that be, 15 years? Anyway, so there we go, so those are the numbers, 76 and 61, so... I'm just putting this out here, I'm doing what I was told by God. So if this helps anybody, if anybody has any information about an unsolved crime that this seems to solve, I recommend uh, getting a hold of, you know, 
the unsolved mystery uh, cold cases department, I think maybe is what they call it, of your local police department. And I would recommend, because you never know who's in on it, I would recommend that you don't just tell one police officer, but that you ensure that there's at least three police officers present when you tell this. Um, and I would also recommend that you keep a diary of the information and send uh, send the information to somebody you trust and to yourself. Um, can't necessarily trust the news to get the actual news out anymore, unfortunately. So there you go. This has been Eric um, Light Wolf, also known as. But uh, if you have any questions, I'll, I'm happy to try to answer them. I really can't tell you much more because that's, I mean, I'm, I'm just blessed that I was able to remember that much. So goodbye for now. Um, love and blessings and love your children and hold them tight and always let them know that you care. Um, peace.